Thank you for joining us for the second annual State of the American Jury System presentation hosted by the Fully Informed Jury Association. My name is Kirsten Tynan, Executive Director of the Fully Informed Jury Association, and I am joined today by an array of panelists here to share their expertise and wisdom with us, who I will introduce to you momentarily. But first, I just want to point out that coincidentally, today is Lysander Spooner's birthday. He's kind of the uh, godfather, I guess you'd say, of jury nullification. So that was a, a nice coincidence. All right, our panelists, we have Catherine Bernard, a public defender and founding partner of Bernard & Johnson, LLC. She leads the firm's criminal and trial practice, focusing on assisting those who are wrongly accused or who are charged with victimless offenses. Catherine is, to our great fortune, Fiji, Georgia State contact, and she has the distinction of having won at least two cannabis cases by way of jury nullification. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Glad to be here. Clark Neely is Senior Vice President for Legal Studies at the Cato Institute. His areas of interest include constitutional law, overcriminalization, and coercive plea bargaining. He's also on the American Bar Association's Task Force on Plea Bargaining. Great to see you here, Clark. Thank you. Huh? Mm -hmm. And all right. And finally, we have the pleasure this year of the live presence instead of a recording of Mike Meharry of the 10th Amendment Center. He writes about both state and jury nullification. Among other topics, he is interested in asset forfeiture and how it undermines the protective function of trial by jury, which is what he will be focusing on today. Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. All right. All right. And off camera, but helping us out in the background with technical details is our wonderful volunteer, Lisa Lewis, who has already saved our bacon once. She will be sharing links with you in the chat and monitoring the chat to help you out if you're having any issues. Before we get started, let me cover three quick details up front. One, yes, this webinar is being recorded. If you're on Facebook, you'll be able to view it shortly on the Fiji Facebook page after the presentation concludes. I'll also be editing a version to post to YouTube. If you registered for the Zoom webinar and are joining us on Zoom, you'll get a follow-up email with the link. Second, if you are on Zoom and have a question for any of our panelists, simply hover your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom window, click on the Q&A icon and enter your question there. If you just put your question in the chat, we're less likely to see, us, see it, so please help us out by uh, 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 shepherding that over to the Q&A feature. If you're on Facebook, Feel free to ask your question in the comments section, but I'll be honest with you, we have a lot of screens going on here and that's probably the least likely place we're gonna see it, but we will do our best. Finally, if you are on Zoom, we have an exciting new feature this year, which you may or may not already be seeing. I have turned on the automatic live transcription option so you can view automatically generated captions if you like. Simply hover your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom window Look for an icon that says CC and click that to be able to turn captions on or off. Now note, those are automatically generated. There may be some errors. That's not something we have control over, but hopefully it is good enough that it will uh, help you if you have any problems hearing. Now, I believe that covers all of the preliminaries. So I'm going to kick off the webinar with a, oh good, I'm, I'm right on time still, with a uh, broad overview of updates from the past year. And then we will turn it over to Catherine who will kind of give us the boots on the ground view from the past year. Uh, Clark Neely will follow, follow Catherine. Um, his focus area is very likely gonna be plea bargaining. <laughs> so we will all be listening very carefully to that. And we are looking forward to hearing updates on various asset forfeiture related issues from Mike Meharry. Just to do a quick and broad overview, let me hit some of the highlights, starting with jury nullification cases since last year's presentation. Now, naturally, I only have a couple of minutes to cover these and 
none of these cases happens to be the sort of poster case most people immediately think of when they think of jury nullification, which are refusals to convict people for victimless offenses. Now, though we don't have time today for an in-depth discussion of each of these cases, I really hope that you will refrain from making snap judgments about them based on what little I can convey to you right now. And instead, go look for more information on these cases with an eye towards understanding why jurors may have made the decision that they did. Um, you may still come away disagreeing, but it would be great if we could at least consider uh, some reason for disagreeing with them other than, oh, jurors are just too stupid. <laughs> so let me start with the United States where we had one possible case of grand jury nullification that I found this past year. In September, a grand jury in Georgia chose not to indict a teenager for the murder of his father when he was 15 years old. The teen had told investigators that he had had enough of his father abusing his mother and that was what motivated his actions, which he did not deny. The father had previously pled guilty to charges of domestic abuse and child cruelty, but was sentenced only to 12 months probation. So you can kind of see there what may have been in the jurors' minds there when they decided that it would be a just outcome to not indict him for that murder. Very sad case. Um, the other cases all that I've seen are from the United Kingdom. We have three cases related to protesters with the Extinction Rebellion movement, a climate change movement. More than a dozen Extinction Rebellion protesters were acquitted last year by their juries in three trials, or I should say since the last presentation, um, in three trials, one in April, one in December, and the most recent just last week. One of those cases involved vandalism of private property at Shell headquarters in London, Two of those cases were for holding up railway traffic. Now, none of the defendants seems to have denied any of the actions they were accused of, but rather argued that those actions were not criminal. And it's not entirely clear to me from what the fine details of UK law are here, but it seems possible that the cases regarding the train delays may not have been jury nullification. I'm just not sure on that. But the reason I say that is because the country's Supreme Court um, had previously overturned convictions of other protesters in similar cases, and it seems to be related to uh, how the UK specifies uh, protest rights. And um, I think the, the ruling said something to the effect that we have to put up with a certain amount of inconvenience. So whether or not that those cases were, were specifically jury nullification, I'm not sure. The private property uh, case does seem pretty likely to be jury nullification. Also, just a few days ago, we had the jury nullification in the trial of the Colston Four. Fro four protesters did not par uh, deny their participation in the toppling of a publicly owned statue of a man named Edward Colston. Uh, but in, as in the Extinction Rebellion cases, they argued that their actions were not the crime, but rather the display of the statue itself. Edward Colston's statue has long had a plaque commending him for his virtue and generosity for making significant financial donations to the city of Bristol. But that plaque has, since its inception, neglected to mention that these donations largely came from his profits in the international trafficking of nearly 100,000 enslaved human beings, several thousand of whom died crossing the Atlantic. Now, attempts have been made either to have the statue removed or the plaque updated starting roughly a century ago, but have yet to come to any sort of fruition. So again, that those are some details that may have played in the jury's minds as they were making their decision. Those are all the cases I have on my radar for, since, the last, um, since the last presentation uh, regarding jury nullification. I have one Supreme Court ruling to report this from this year in the case of Edwards versus Vinoy. Now the 2020 majority opinion in Ramos versus Louisiana, Louisiana overturned decades of bad precedent allowing non-unanimous convictions in criminal trials by jury and called jury, jury unanimity vital, essential, indispensable, fundamental, momentous, and outright stated that, quote, a verdict taken from 11 was no verdict at all, end quote. 
The majority opinion in Ramos versus Louisiana was penned by Neil Gorsuch, but this year he did an about face, siding with the conservative majority of the court and stating that such a vital, essential, independent, indispensable, fundamental, and momentous ruling did not constitute what the Supreme Court considers a quote unquote watershed rule. And that is the rare type of rule that the court previously ruled warranted revisiting convictions that had already been settled. So this ruling literally left thousands of prisoners who were denied a proper trial by jury stuck in prison because their trials were already considered settled. They had gone through their whole appeals process previously. Though the ruling did not require that these people whose verdicts the court had previously said were no verdict at all be retried or released, it did leave the door open for the states that allowed these thousands of unconstitutional convictions to correct these egregious violations if they so chose. <laughs> well, let's move into legislative and policy changes to find out what happened with that. <laughs> I will start by mentioning that I'm not gonna cover asset forfeiture reform as I'm thinking that's probably going to be talked about by Mike. I will just stick to the highlights of other jury related legislation and policy changes. The two states primarily affected by um, the Ramos versus Louisiana and Edwards v versus Vinoy decisions are Oregon and Louisiana. To my knowledge, neither of them has passed legislation fixing this problem um, in any way providing relief to any of these people who are currently considered stuck in prison indefinitely um, th through the end of their sentence uh, because of non-unanimous convictions. The only action I've seen on this, I, there have been legislative um, proposals made, uh, but not passed. There have been in Louisiana, one parish actually had a prosecutor who started looking at these uh, convictions and starting to um, go case by case, one by one to figure out who they could um, release from prison and or give a new trial to. So very little movement on that, but that is something that is still being worked. So we'll keep an eye on that for this year. Um, something else that I wanna, I found notable this year was that after the state of Virginia unbundled the right to trial by jury from jury sentencing, it saw a big uptick in people exercising the right to trial by jury. What am I talking about? Well, previously in Virginia, if you said, I want a jury trial, that automatically meant you were sentenced by your jury and the rules under which the jury sentenced you were far harsher than what the judge could sentence you under. So in order to avoid unfair, harsh sentencing, people were just saying, forget it, no jury trial for me and forfeiting that right. Since it's been unbundled, however, people are exercising the right to trial by jury and often opting for sentencing by judge if convicted. And this has prosecutors in Virginia throwing tantrums left and right. Oh, it's not fair these people are exercising their rights. We don't have enough resources. Well, hoo hoo hoo. All right, last up I wanna mention Arizona. Arizona has a very notable change this year. It is not um, a legislative change, but a rule from the Arizona State Supreme Court. As far as I can tell, this is unprecedented, um, at least in modern history. I don't know about colonial times, but Arizona has ended the use of peremptory challenges in state courts. Uh, the the um, reasoning behind this seems to have to do with juror discrimination. Um, we have a lot of problems with um, how jurors are selected. It is officially illegal to kick someone off the jury, either for their race, their sex, and in various places, other reasons. But there aren't really any effective um, ways for enforcing that. So in this case, Arizona seems to be addressing that by simply getting rid of peremptory challenges altogether. And that is notable for us here in the jury nullification world, not only because of the increased inclusion of people on juries, but it also is gonna, in, in my, uh, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here, my hypothesis is that it, it will also perhaps have an effect on how easy it is um, for people to get kicked off because they have objections to the law or maybe um, have other qualms about, um, about what they're doing. Um, so I'm hoping that this is a way that um, helps fully informed jurors actually get on juries. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Bernard, um, who 
will give us our boots on the ground view. Catherine? Thank you so much, Kirsten. And uh, welcome everybody. It's, it's so wonderful to be here with the Fully Informed Jury Association, which is, as I think everybody here knows, just one of the best organizations and nonprofits in the country about actually providing information that we can all use as part of our civic duties. So I remember when I came to you last year on uh, 2021, we were just coming off of a year of no jury trials at all. And that was certainly an unusual and unpleasant situation. So now I'm coming to you in 2022, having done four trials last year, and that would be four felony trials, um, all of them quite lengthy and uh, a good mix of different kinds of cases, not any victimless crime cases, interestingly enough. So I don't have as clear of a perspective on how jury nullification can potentially work under these new COVID-19 protocols. Uh, but I can certainly tell you that the same trends that we have been seeing across the country about the curtailment of right to trial by jury, that has all been accelerated by the pandemic, which probably comes as no surprise to anyone here. We all know that prosecutors and judges, there are plenty of them that regard the right to trial by jury as an inconvenience something that keeps the court from running as smoothly as they would like it to go with all of their plea bargains and convictions. And so they are looking for any excuse whatsoever to limit that. And of course, COVID-19 has provided the perfect one in terms of limiting people's ability to gather in groups and uh, speak with each other, which of course is the very heart of a jury trial at every stage from summoning the jurors together at the beginning where they are spoken to by the attorneys and asked questions about their potential biases on any cases to the trial itself, which of course involves public speaking. And then of course, to the deliberation process where typically the jurors have all gone to a small room together in order to speak and deliberate on these subjects of immense importance. So the COVID-19 protocols have limited all of that. The, the four trials that I have done have all been in different counties, and so they've had very different approaches. The trial that I did in May, things were still very strict. It was one of the first trials that this particular county, Walton County, Georgia, had done, and the, the judge was very concerned about making sure that the jurors felt safe and secure, which of course is a, is a concern that attorneys need to share as well, because a juror that is feeling fearful and uncomfortable is not gonna be a juror who's able to pay attention to the case and what's going on. Uh, in that case, my client absolutely refused to wear a mask and I fully supported his right to do that. Um, I have created a mask motion that I've been filing in all of my cases it's a calendar announcement regarding COVID-19 protocols where we go into the reasons why defendants and attorneys should not be required to wear masks and why that prejudices the defendant's rights. Um, we even cite to some old cases, you know, here in Georgia that, um, you know, in Georgia, it is illegal to wear a mask. We actually have a statute making it a misdemeanor that dates back from Ku, Ku Klux Klan days, where people would, of course, wear masks to go about and cause harm in the community. So there is a, a rich irony in the court now trying to force people to wear masks in order to participate in public life. So the mask motion that I filed cites to that precedent regarding the way that masks are associated with criminal behavior, that someone who covers their face is somebody who is perhaps fearful or cowardly or ashamed. And so any sort of association of that masking with a defendant is naturally prejudicial to his or her rights. A juror who is viewing this person who they are already seeing in the context of a courtroom, surrounded by deputies, surrounded by the trappings of authority and power, for that person to then be masked completely dehumanizes him or her. And so uh, we did have a pretty serious conflict with the judge as to my client's right to not be masked that uh, did result in my client being briefly taken into custody and brought before the judge who uh, we had a little bit of a, a standoff and ultimately uh, we were successful. Uh, the judge determined my client did not have to wear a mask, but uh, the attorneys were required to wear masks. So uh, I, I cannot really speak effectively in a mask. I, I don't think other people can either really from what I've heard. So we were forced to wear the face shields uh, around our face. And uh, let me tell you for anyone who thinks that those are better than masks, absolutely not. Uh, they, they create the most bizarre acoustics. 
you cannot have any kind of private communication with your client in the courtroom because the sound bounces off and goes elsewhere. And so really, um, while I was, you know, I was very fortunate, we did get a two word verdict and my client was found not guilty of criminal damage to property for a conflict with an off duty police officer in his neighborhood. Um, it was it was really a close one. And I, I really felt that his rights were prejudiced, even though he did not have to wear a mask. The fact that the jurors were all asked to be masked, the fact that his attorneys were wearing these face shields, um, it, was, it, it felt like having our hands tied behind our back during the trial. So despite the good outcome, that was very concerning. So I have continued to file this motion in other trials. Other counties have been a little more flexible. I've been able to ask in voir dire the jurors, you know, how do you feel about this mask situation? And I've gotten mixed responses. Some people are comfortable wearing masks, some people aren't. And what I have tried to do is empower the jurors to remember that it's not up to the government to tell them whether, you know, what they can wear when they serve on a jury. They are the most important people in the courtroom. They have ultimate power over every single government agent there. And so for the government to tell them what they can or cannot do in terms of where you must sit, what you must wear, that is an extremely limiting uh, limiting situation that makes it even more difficult to empower the jury. So uh, the remaining trials I had, it was uh, one, one trial when I told the jurors they didn't have to wear masks, they all took them off immediately. And so no one wore masks for the entire trial. Um, in another one, some of the jurors kept them on, some of them took them off. And as the trial went on, more and more of the jurors took them off as they became more comfortable with the situation. Um, so that's, that seems to me to be the good balance that we have right now um, in the courtrooms that are permitting that, which is let the jurors make the choice. It's still not perfect to not be able to see the facial expressions of jurors, particularly during voir dire, where it's important to ask questions about potential biases that the jurors may have, because there are plenty of times when you ask a question about, does anyone, is anyone bothered by my client's dreadlocks or tattoos? And you might not get someone raising their hand to say, yes, I'm bothered, but they might make a little motion with their mouth or they might make some kind of expression that tells you this person has had a reaction to it that perhaps they are not comfortable sharing with the group. So even though that is a restriction, having jurors wear masks at all, I think the most important thing that we have to stick on, the lesson from this, is that the government should never force jurors to wear masks. I don't think the government should force jurors not to wear masks. Um, and that, that may be something other defense attorneys can go back and forth on. Uh, but in general, I think the primacy of the jury's independence needs to be respected on the mask issue. Another issue that's come up um, from the practitioner's perspective is courtroom access, which is something that has already been limited by many judges. You'll notice many judges, if they see someone come into the courtroom to sit as part of the audience, they will ask that person, you know, what are you here for? Why are you here? which that can be very intimidating for someone who is coming to participate in the process. They've already had to go through a security screening at the front door. And so it really takes away from the idea that the courthouse is the center of public life accessible to everyone. And so um, one of the problems with the COVID protocols is that jurors are often no longer sitting in the jury box in the designated area in the courtroom. Instead, they are being spread out throughout the audience which uh, again, wherever the jurors are most comfortable, but that does limit access to the public and limit the ability of other folks to come in and watch the trial proceedings. So um, that's, that's another thing that we have to keep a close eye on. Another issue that has come up quite a bit for practitioners is the confrontation clause issue as video uh, witnesses have become something that both the prosecution and the defense have sought to use. Of course, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution guarantees the right to confront your accusers. And the question is, is that uh, valid when your accuser appears by video? My position has tended to be that the defendant should have the choice of whether or not to allow testimony by video, because certainly there are some situations where it may be advantageous to a defendant to be able to bring someone in by Zoom who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. However, it should always be the defendant's choice of whether to waive that right, not something that can be forced upon you by the state. Because as a corollary to this, um, you know, because of COVID, 
uh, incarcerated clients, particularly those in the prison, um, in the prison context, have increasingly been appearing at court hearings by Zoom themselves. And again, sometimes for just an arraignment, that's fine, but it is it severely limits the ability of counsel to communicate with their client when they are both by Zoom. You know, being in a breakout room is nothing like having a communication directly, to say nothing of the confidentiality issues of relying on a state medium of communication for those private attorney client privileged conversations. Um, and I did want to note there was a recently a Missouri Supreme Court decision where some public defenders had challenged the appearance of state witnesses by video conference. And they fought very hard for that all year and recently received decisions that um, those cases, the convictions were reversed and remanded for violations of the confrontation clause. So it's the, the masks, the courtroom access to for the public and confrontation clause through video conference that have really been the three biggest issues we've seen with COVID-19 protocols through the year and they have prejudiced defendants rights and so I, I hope that we can all continue to keep an eye out for them and continue to push for again jurors to be informed um, because it, it can't just be up to the defendant and his or her attorney this has to be up to the jurors in a community to say hey, we want to participate in a fair trial. We don't want to be here just as a rubber stamp for the government. Thank you so much, Catherine. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna turn it over to Clark Neely. Clark, take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Kirsten. It's great to see uh, Catherine and, and uh, you and Mike again. You know, I, I think um, two things are true. Um, first, Nothing fundamentally has changed um, when it comes to um, the domination um, that, that plea bargaining uh, has in our system, by which I mean uh, the government's preference for inducing people to plead guilty uh, rather than exercise their right to trial. That has not changed, and really neither has the government's um, ability to coerce people into making that decision. The vast amount or the vast number of criminal convictions in our system still come uh, from guilty pleas, more than 95%. I think that's extraordinarily troubling for a number of reasons that'll be familiar to uh, all of the panelists uh, and our listeners, and I won't belabor those. Um, but what it really boils down to um, is a, a perception uh, among prosecutors, judges, and other players in the system that the normal course of events in a criminal prosecution is that it should culminate in the defendant uh, waiving their right to a trial and simply agreeing to condemn themselves. And it's hard to think of anything more pathological um, and more deleterious to uh, a system of justice than one in which all of the relevant actors, including the ones who wield the most power, and that's prosecutors, and the ones who wield the second most amount of power, that's judges, um, have come to believe uh, that in the normal course of things, virtually everybody uh, will eventually agree to plead guilty. And then of course the whole system uh, sort of organizes and optimizes itself for that outcome. And defendants who exercise their constitutional right to a jury trial are increasingly looked at um, as being obstructive, um, as wasting the time uh, of the court um, and, and essentially uh, getting in the way of the efficient administration of justice. And, and, and that's a disaster from any standpoint, that's, that's a disaster. Now, there is, I think, some good news over the past year, and it's important to share that. And that is that in some ways, I really think that 2021, particularly the last half of 2021, was kind of the year of the jury trial. There were a number of very high profile uh, cases that went to trial, um, and I'll list a few of those. Most of you are probably familiar with the prosecution of Kyle Rittenhouse, um, who uh, famously um, uh, was charged with murder um, for killing three people um, during protests uh, in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Now, reasonable people can differ about um, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse's culpability, both moral and legal, uh, but we all benefited, uh, I think very clearly, we as society benefited from the opportunity um, to see the government present its evidence against Kyle Rittenhouse and to see that evidence tested in court. And I'm not gonna elaborate or editorialize on that particular case, uh, other than to simply say, um, however you think 
um, he should have been treated. Whatever you think of the, the uh, culpability uh, or lack of culpability for what he did, um, I hope we can all agree that, that, that we were all benefited from the ability to see all of the evidence presented in a public forum, which is so unusual. Uh, and of course, that was a controversial event, and now we're all better educated for it. Same thing in the Elizabeth Holmes prosecution. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but Elizabeth Holmes was this uh, you know, sort of young uh, kind of wonderkind uh, who dropped out of Stanford at the age of 19 and created a company in Silicon Valley called Theranos um, that was going to uh, supposedly revolutionize uh, blood testing and run hundreds of tests uh, from a single drop of blood that would currently require multiple uh, blood draws with a needle. Uh, the problem was that she got way out ahead of the actual technology. She certainly had a hold of a very good idea, uh, but the allegation in the case was that she came to serially misrepresent to investors and, and even patients and companies that she wanted to partner with um, how far they had gotten uh, with trying to implement this revolutionary blood testing technology. Um, and she was at one time, um, in terms of the valuation of the company and her stock ownership, she was a multi, multi-billionaire um, in her 20s. And again, very much like the Rittenhouse case, reasonable people can differ about her moral and legal culpability, uh, but we got to see the government present its evidence against her Elizabeth Holmes in open court over a period of several months. It was an extremely compelling trial. I followed it very closely. Um, and, um, you know, again, uh, I think we as society really benefited from the opportunity um, to see exactly what she did and, and hear witnesses on both sides, including Elizabeth Holmes, who actually ended up taking the stand. She was ultimately convicted on four of the 11 uh, counts against her and will be sentenced later this year. Other uh, trials that I won't uh, belabor are Jesse Smollett uh, in Chicago. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the charges in that case. Jelaine Maxwell, uh, who was alleged and now stands convicted uh, of, of helping uh, Jeffrey Epstein uh, victimize um, young women. Um, and the killers of Ahmoud uh, Arbery uh, in Georgia, the three men uh, who chased Mr. Arbery and ultimately uh, shot him down in the street. So um, we had a number of cases, including some highly uh, uh, controversial um, and well-publicized cases, went to trial this year, got a lot of attention. And it's really given those of us who support uh, the idea of trying to go back to uh, jury trials as the default mechanism for adjudicating criminal charges, the ability to point at those cases and say, look how much better it is. Look how much better our system works and look how much more confidence people have in the system when they can actually see the government present its evidence against the accused and see that evidence tested in the crucible of an adversarial proceeding. And it's no accident that the founders of this country and the framers of the Constitution went to such extraordinary lengths to put the criminal jury trial at the very heart of the administration of criminal justice. It's not like there's some better mechanism out there for adjudicating criminal charges. And, you know, we just, all of humanity sort of missed it for like eight centuries, including three centuries since the Enlightenment. The fact of the matter is that when the government levels serious charges against a citizen for which they could lose their freedom or even their life, there is really only one optimal way of adjudicating those charges, and that is in front of a citizen jury of people drawn from the community who don't have a dog in the fight. They don't work for the justice system. It's not part of their day-to-day -day job to process people through the system. And the genius of that insight, the genius of the insight that we must put ordinary citizens at the very heart of the administration of criminal justice is perhaps the single greatest loss um, from a societal level standpoint. Obviously, individuals who are coerced into pleading guilty uh, pay an individual price, but the price we pay for society um, for coercive plea bargaining um, is the loss of this amazing insight that the founders of this country had about the proper way to adjudicate criminal charges um, in a liberal democracy like ours. Um, so I don't know where this leaves us exactly, but I do think we're in better shape right now than we were, let's say, a year ago, because um, we can point again to these high profile cases that resulted or that culminated in this very unusual uh, criminal or jury trial, which again is very unusual in our system, and, um, and, and the results in those cases 
again, were often very controversial going in, but my perception is at least is that the results in those cases have not been particularly controversial. Doesn't mean that people don't disagree about them, but people got an opportunity to see what the evidence in the case was. We don't have to speculate about what the government might have been able to prove or what the defendant could have brought to trial or whether the government's evidence uh, and witnesses could have been impeached. We got to see it all. And that's exactly the way the system was designed to work. And I am uh, I'm gratified by the ability to point to those cases and say, look, this is what our system looks like uh, when it's working properly. And it is so much better. It is so much better when criminal prosecutions are resolved through constitutionally prescribed jury trials rather than the ability of a prosecutor to simply condemn some, or uh, uh, coerce somebody into condemning themselves. So I'm, I'm sort of, I, I don't think it's necessarily going to, uh, you know, set off any kind of a domino effect. I certainly don't think that this time next year, we're going to see a massive uptick in the amount of cases that go to trial. Um, but it is, I think, incremental progress, and we will continue to make incremental progress. And my colleagues and I at the Cato Institute, and I know Catherine and others, we certainly will not rest until we have made much, and, and person as well, certainly will not rest until we have done everything in our power to restore constitutionally prescribed jury trials as the default mechanism for adjudicating criminal charges in this country, just like the founders intended. Thank you so much, Clark. All right, moving right along, Mike Meharry is up. Mike, please share with us your wisdom. Well, again, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be part of this panel. Uh, a lot of great information already. And uh, hopefully I can add a little bit to that. I'm going to talk about asset forfeiture. I'm going to assume that most people are at least uh, marginally familiar with what asset forfeiture is. Uh, in effect, it's just the state taking somebody's property um, because it was either used in a crime or it was the fruit of a crime. And on the surface, that seems fine. It seems just if somebody you know gets a bunch of money from a criminal activity, it's seems reasonable for that to be taken away from them. If they're using their property in a criminal enterprise, it seems reasonable to, uh, to take that away. The problem with it is in the process itself. There are actually two forms of asset forfeiture that we see in the United States. There's criminal asset forfeiture and there is civil asset forfeiture. Criminal asset forfeiture is less problematic. It actually requires a criminal conviction before the state can proceed with seizing these assets permanently. So, um, again, that's not so much of a problem. The civil asset forfeiture process, though, is rife with problems and really flips the criminal justice system on its head. The first problem with it is it doesn't require a conviction. So you can have your stuff taken away from you, even if you've never been found guilty of a crime. And I think most reasonable people hear that and they go, well, that's not right. And that's because it's not right. Um, the other problem with civil asset forfeiture, I mean, not only do you not have to have a conviction, oftentimes police don't even have to have an arrest. They can literally take property away and let you go. And we've seen this happen in, in numerous cases. You can read about them. Institute for Justice does great work in tracking what's going on with uh, civil asset forfeiture. And they, there are all kinds of horror stories. Um, you know, For instance, you have a, a guy that's got $10,000 in his car because he's going to purchase a new vehicle. And uh, police pull him over and find this $10,000 in cash and automatically assume that this must be drug money. So they seize the $10,000. They let the guy go on its way. Now the guy is out $10,000 and it becomes incumbent upon him to prove that this money was not used, uh, is, is not drug money. And you can start to see how this flips the criminal justice system on its head because it puts the burden of proof on the person who has been accused. And the reason that it works like this, the reason they can get away with this is because the criminal case is not actually against the individual. The criminal case is literally filed against the property. So you'll see these bizarre you know, um, uh, court cases, the, the state of Florida versus uh, you know, a Honda Civic and twenty thousand dollars in cash, and again, it becomes incumbent upon the person who owns this property to prove that uh, they were not involved in a crime and that it was not the 
fruit of criminal activity, and it's very difficult for people to get their property back. In fact, a lot of times people don't even bother because they can't afford the expense to go through the uh, the criminal or the civil process in order to get their stuff back. So the state ends up getting to keep their stuff. Um, there's this whole other aspect of it where in many states, police departments get to keep some and in many cases, all of the proceeds from asset forfeiture. So there's this policing for profit incentive uh, that motivates police to go after people's stuff um, instead of really trying to fight crime. Uh, it prioritizes police resources toward uh, things where they can seize assets and away from you know, murder investigations, uh, property crimes, things like that, where they're not going to be able to get any cool new toys uh, by going through the forfeiture process. Um, we have asset forfeiture uh, at the state level. We also have asset forfeiture at the federal level. And uh, it depends on you know, which jurisdiction has seized the property uh, that will determine where it is heard. Uh, oftentimes, state agents can uh, pass cases onto the federal government. Oftentimes, that allows them to uh, collect more of the proceeds. Uh, sometimes it's easier for the federal uh, government to prosecute the case. So there's this whole web of forfeiture that goes on at, uh, at, the, at the civil level. And you know, it's pretty clear, as I'm saying this, I'm sure to most people, how this undermines the jury process, uh, because oftentimes nobody's been charged with the crime. And in many states, the civil asset forfeiture process does not even require uh, a jury. It is actually adjudicated in front of a judge, and uh, so there's no jury involved at all. And even in states where a jury is required, uh, the basis for proving somebody guilty is much less the uh the um oh gosh my brain just went dead the rules of evidence are different so whereas you have to have uh you know um uh clear and convincing evidence uh in some cases uh sometimes it's just a preponderance of evidence in other words it's very difficult for the person who has had their assets seized to ever get their assets back and uh so it's a way that a person can be punished without ever being charged with a crime. And, uh, you know, again, I think this is something that most rational people look at and say, this is absolutely not right. This is a process that should not happen. A person should not have uh, be subject to losing their property just because the police alleged that they committed a crime and then the burden is on them to prove that they didn't. Uh, in the American system, we have a long tradition of innocent until proven guilty and the burden is supposed to be upon the prosecution. So again, this flips the criminal justice system, system completely on its head. It undermines uh, the jury trial, it undermines justice, um, I, I think in a very significant way. So what can we do about it? Well, that's where there's, I think, Good news, because we are beginning to see a very strong movement in the United States toward asset forfeiture reform. Um, and there are many states that are looking to simply scrap the civil asset forfeiture process and move to a criminal process that does require a criminal conviction before the asset forfeiture can go forward. Um, in the uh, last year, we have had uh, three states that had some type of reform. Maine actually did do away with their civil asset forfeiture process and replaced it with a criminal process last year. Uh, and that was the most significant change. We also saw um, some reforms in Arizona where they made it more difficult for states to pass on uh, these cases to the federal government and allow the federal government to prosecute them. And this is oftentimes used as a, a kind of way to circumvent more strict state laws. Uh, in California, for instance, they had some of the most strict state asset forfeiture laws. So what police departments were doing was they're simply saying, oh, we're working with the federal government. Uh, the federal government would adopt the cases. The cases would get prosecuted at the federal level, thereby avoiding the more strict state process. And then the, uh, the police would get up to 80% of those proceeds back from the federal government. So California, uh, recognizing this, actually changed their process to prohibit, uh, in most cases, state agents from passing these cases onto the feds. And this is a very important aspect of any asset forfeiture reform. This did happen, uh, I believe, in Maine, um, Arizona, 
uh, shifted their process to make it more difficult to adopt these states. And then we also saw some, uh, some reforms in Utah uh, where they had actually had a voter referendum a number of years ago uh, to reform their asset forfeiture process. And then along the way, uh, the government managed to muck it up. And uh, um, there were some court rulings and some things like that that played into some of vague language and was allowing forfeitures to proceed uh, more loosely than was intended by this uh, referendum. So the legislator, legislature went back, clarified the language in the law, and uh, kind of reinstituted those tougher processes. So that's good news in those three states. Uh, this year, we've just begun the state legislative process. Most state legislatures adjourn for the year in January, typically run through the spring. And thus far, I've got my, my handy dandy post-it note. Uh, we've seen uh, bills introduced for asset forfeiture reform in Georgia, in Hawaii, in Indiana, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, New York, Oklahoma, and West Virginia. Uh, some of these involve scrapping the civil process altogether and replacing it with a criminal process. Some of these uh, reforms are less uh, sweeping, but would at least make it more difficult for the state to take people's stuff uh, raising the evidentiary standards and, and things like that. So we do expect to see more states enter into uh, the ring of reforming asset forfeiture in the coming year. Um, this has been a rapidly growing movement. Again, the Institute for Justice has been very strongly behind this and uh, has very, very good model legislation. Um, you know, one thing that you could do if you're out there and uh, you know you want to try to make a difference in this process, uh, contact your state representative and or your state senator and ask them to sponsor asset forfeiture reform. Uh, you know it's politically expedient for a lot of these folks because again, a lot of people, whether they you know tend to the left or right or the center of the political spectrum, recognize the inherent problems with asset forfeiture. They recognize that a person's property shouldn't be subject to seizure by the state uh, simply on the assertion of uh, law enforcement. And uh, so the, uh, the, the, the grassroots push for reform is very strong right now. And I think this is an opportunity that, opportunity that needs to be seized. That said, you're gonna run up against a lot of uh, opposition and it's going to come from law enforcement. Uh, they have a vested interest in this process because it brings them lots of money and cool stuff. And uh, there is a very strong policing uh, for profit incentive in the forfeiture process. And police lobbies are very strong, uh, particularly in states with uh, Republican majorities. They tend to defer to law enforcement arguments. So um, if you're in one of these states where there is asset forfeiture reform uh, in play, uh, I highly encourage you to take the time to, again, call your state representative, call your state senator, let them know you support this asset forfeiture reform. They need to hear voices other than the law enforcement lobbyists that are going to be in their ear. And this is something you can take 10 or 15 minutes out of your day and actually make a big difference. I tell people all the time that involving yourself in the state legislative process is much more fruitful than calling your congressman. Uh, a lot of these folks in state government they don't get a lot of phone calls about specific legislation. And if they get 20 or 30 uh, phone calls or emails, uh, it does make a difference. I have actually seen bills get moved out of committee that were stuck just by uh, you know, 30 or 40 people making phone calls to a, a committee chairman. So, uh, um, well, wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off there so we can get I, a couple I was done. questions in. <laughs> Not to be rude, but no. Nope. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions that were quite popular and uh, one that I want to cover that I didn't get to in my portion. I'll start with that one. To say the least, the situation for speedy trials is abysmal with most courts around the country having 12 to 16 months out of the past, uh, about, uh, out of the entire pandemic thus far, be downtime with no jury trials. Um, so for Clark and Catherine, I am wondering, um, what do you think is an actual reasonable time frame for speedy trials? Um, and you might want to talk about felony versus misdemeanor and detained versus not detained pending trial. And why, why are those numbers not firm? Why is it that the government can just give itself pass after pass after pass? We'll start with Clark and then go to Catherine. 
Yeah, I know. <clears throat> so the Constitution guarantees the right to a public and speedy trial. Um, and like so many terms on the Constitution, speedy is not defined, but we look to background principles um, and, and historical practice to try to get a sense of what's reasonable. Um, the Federal Speedy Trial Act uh, provides that the government um, is supposed to be able to bring a case, is supposed to not be able to, this has an obligation to bring a case to trial uh, within, I believe, days. Um, obtaining indictment. So the government's really not supposed to indict a defendant until they're basically ready to try the case. Um, you know, the problem is in, not surprisingly, all of the ways that the judiciary has come up with to enable the government um, to evade its speedy trial obligations. So there's both statutory obligations. There is a statute at the federal level and, 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 and in many states um, that, that sort of quantifies the amount of time the government has, but then there's this constitutional provision um, that also requires a speedy trial. But again, the, the real problem here um, is the creativity of the judiciary, which uh, as most of you probably already know is disproportionately composed of former prosecutors um, who many of whom have sort of, you know, evolved with this mindset. Uh, and it's just very easy uh, for the government to come up with uh, excuses for extending uh, the, the uh, amount of time. And Catherine, I'm sure, can get into the details of that. Uh, but there are just lots of ways uh, that the government can uh, essentially get a free pass to um, extend and, 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 frankly, evade uh, its Speedy Trial Act obligations. And uh, many prosecutors are extraordinarily adept um, at, um, at invoking and deploying those exceptions. So the, uh, both the judiciary and the, um, uh, the prosecution are, uh, I would say, you know, equally at fault uh, for the fact that the speedy trial uh, requirements are not uh, you know, as robust as they ought to be. And Catherine, would you like to weigh in on that? The speedy trial issue is a complicated one because, you know, we do here in Georgia have a statutory speedy trial, right, which is where if you formally demand a speedy trial, they are required to try you within that next term of court or the term immediately after for a capital case, anything where you could potentially get the death penalty, even if it's not on the table, they do get an extra term of court. But of course, in some places, a term of court is six months. In some places, a term of court is two months. And so really, um, I think for incarcerated clients, that, that is the biggest priority right now. And at, you know the right to a speedy trial has been denied for a long time for these folks, even well before the, the pandemic. But of course, the backlog has just made it even more of a disaster. Uh, for the cases that I mentioned trying last year, uh, two of the individuals had been in trial, had been in custody for almost three years pending trial. Um, you know, they had been held without bond. And they were very serious charges, of course, but that that's really, to me, really at the very outside edge of what should even be constitutionally permissible. However, I also have to acknowledge that, you know, prosecutors and judges are certainly to blame for a lot of it. And certainly whenever I see a trial calendar that has a whole bunch of cases on it with victimless crimes, you know, that's clogging up the calendar and keeping the real crimes from being tried, the real things where the, the community does have an interest in having it tried. But I have to acknowledge that as a defense attorney who represents people all over the state, it is sometimes my schedule and my conflicts that prohibit a trial from, from being tried at a given time. And so, you know, I, I have to acknowledge it's not always the prosecutors. Sometimes it is the, the schedule of a defense attorney. And in that case, you really just have to prioritize the incarcerated folks over others right now. Uh, one question that I kind of consolidated a bunch of people's questions was about something else we haven't covered. A number of people had questions about cases that just don't get a trial and how we can fix that. So for instance, uh, the government has largely or completely eliminated the option of a jury in asset forfeiture cases, immigration courts come to mind. David specifically asked about family law type cases such as termination of parental rights child custody, et cetera, and astutely points out that these are types of issues that probably many more people are affected by the lack of jury on than, say, criminal cases. Um, what can we do about that? Is there, is there any, are there any prospects for getting juries back in, on those types of cases? 
Well, I think you got to pick your battles, to be honest. Um, the judges tend to be extremely hostile uh, to jury trials. I mean, they know they're not supposed to act like it and they're supposed to say they're not, but they are. Um, and they're time consuming. Uh, uh, picking a jury and uh, uh, running a jury trial is a, is, is a, a complex and time consuming process. Um, and part of the problem here is the way that uh, judges have interpreted various constitutional guarantees. So for example, the Seventh Amendment uh, guarantees the right to a jury trial uh, in civil cases, but the uh, judiciary uh, has interpreted that so it doesn't apply um, to things like an administrative proceeding or a trial uh, or a, a lawsuit where the defendant, um, I'm sorry, the plaintiff is seeking purely injunctive relief. Um, in other words, the Seventh Amendment has been interpreted only to apply uh, to a very special subset uh, of litigation involving uh, civil rights, uh, I'm sorry, civil claims um, involving money damages. And um, again, I know it's sort of like, I sound like a broken record, Record, but the judiciary has been extraordinarily creative um, in limiting uh, the scope uh, of the right to a jury trial. And um, I personally am not so sure that, that uh, I mean, you have to, again, pick your battles. And if you're going to put a whole bunch of effort into saying, hey, there should be a jury trial for, you know, family law cases, for example, uh, which maybe there should be, uh, then that's going to be time that you didn't spend advocating for uh, jury trials in criminal cases where I think the need is more acute. Um, that's easy for me to say. I understand that. I've not been involved in a family law case personally, um, but you have to ask yourself every single time you wake up, what is the most important thing that I can fight for today? Because our time is limited and the bandwidth of policymakers is limited. And uh, if you spend that time or that bandwidth uh, on, on something that's that's a lower priority than, than a higher priority is necessarily going to go unaddressed. I know it's not easy, but you have to prioritize. And Catherine, any thoughts on that? I, I do think that the constitutional right to trial by jury has just been eviscerated in all of these fields, which as we mentioned, family law, immigration, all these areas that are legitimate controversies that are that have both civil and criminal components. You have property at risk, you have liberty at risk, you have lives at risk when you are talking about something like the custody of children. And so uh, some of the folks may remember, I had a case a few years ago about a family that was giving their son cannabis to treat his seizures. And you know the the fight over the criminal side of that was was a, a small fraction of the case. You know we were actually able to beat the reckless conduct charges and get them dismissed. But it was the work that you know particularly um, a Macon attorney Lauren Deal did on the family law side of the case where the real challenge was. And so I do think we need to to keep that in mind that jury trials. You know we we have got we have normalized a situation in which jury trials are denied for a lot of legitimate controversies. But I also understand. Clark's point, you know, at, at this point, we do not have a right to jury trial in the federal courts for misdemeanors. That is ludicrous to me that they can stack up six month charges on you and force you into a bench trial. And I just had a judge uh, last week sort of go off on a rant threatening that, you know, maybe this is going to happen here in Georgia. They're going to, you know, take a, the legislature and all their wisdom will take away the right to misdemeanor jury trials. And it was hard to tell whether the judge actually thought that was a good idea or not. Um, but really, I, I agree, we need jury trials uh, everywhere we can get them. And that right has been systematically denied. So I, I wonder what this conversation would have looked like 100 years ago you know, where I think uh, perhaps the right to trial by jury was was taken more for granted and then has been administratively and bureaucratically curtailed systematically in a way that we have normalized. Well, you know, of course, it's going to be a guy in a robe making that decision. Mike, I have a couple questions from you for Je from Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey would like to know, has pre-conviction asset forfeiture been challenged on constitutional grounds and who would have standing to bring such a case? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, so I don't know. I, I do. I've litigated these cases. Um, the short answer is no, um, and that's not a plausible challenge. Uh, what what has been challenged is the government's failure to provide a prompt pre-seizure or post-seizure hearing. Uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, has said that when the government takes your property, um, the, the default is that they are supposed to provide a pre-seizure hearing if possible. That means that you get to go in front of a neutral judge or other magistrate um, and not get a, a final ruling on the merits, but just sort of have a chance to you know, come in and say, look, I, you know, they've got the wrong person. I, I, I am John Smith, but I have a different middle name so that I'm not the right person. 
Um, and the one of the things I won't get into this too much, but it's incredibly frustrating as somebody's litigated these forfeiture cases and had to listen to prosecutors tell audiences, oh, you know, if there were any problem with this, the Supreme Court would tell us. That is absolutely false. It is a malicious lie, and they should know that it is, and here's why. Um, the government actually, in many settings, particularly in forfeiture, actually has the ability to frustrate judicial review, to prevent the judiciary from declaring that a particular practice, like civil forfeiture as a whole, or even a particular practice, a particular kind of civil forfeiture is unconstitutional. How can they do it? And they do this all the time, by the way. What they do is they will fight you right up until the point where it looks like you might be about to win. In other words, you're about to get a favorable court ruling that will not only result in the return of your property, but could also result in favorable precedent. Maybe that particular approach to forfeiture being struck down. And guess what the government not only can do, but I've seen them do repeatedly, they moot the case. That means they give back the property. So now you've got your car back or you've got your cash back. And the judge then says, oh, well, there's nothing to fight about anymore. This is, this is a moot case. I'm, I'm not here to issue an advisory opinion. The case is over. And you don't get a ruling on the merits of that practice. And that actually happened in a Supreme Court case where the city of Chicago was doing these drug arrests where they would go in, they would do the drug bust, and they would pretty much grab any car that they could see on the block where the thing happened. And you wouldn't get a hearing for over a year. That ended up getting struck down uh, by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. It went up to the Supreme Court. The city could see the handwriting on the wall. They knew they were going to lose that case and potentially set bad precedent. You want to guess what they did? They gave everybody back their cars. And the Supreme Court said, oh, well, it looks like we don't have a case here. So I think there's a lot of unconstitutional uh, uh, practices in civil forfeiture. But what's really hard is getting courts to rule on them because the government is so cynical um, and so unwilling to test the legality of what they do on a daily basis, and they will turn tail and run from their own practices uh, by mooting cases when it looks like they're about to lose. And it is a despicable and cynical act uh, on the part of government, and I've seen it over and over again. Well, I am now thoroughly infuriated. <laughs> <laughs> that thought I started out that way, learned I wasn't. <laughs> but Always, always learn something new that is uh, horrifying in a new and exciting way. Um, I still have more questions, uh, but we are out of time. So what I think I will do is try and answer some of these afterward and put a page up on the FIJA website with some of these answers. Apologies to those whose questions we didn't get to. Perhaps next year we will make this a little bit longer event because there are some great questions this year. Um, I want to let everyone know, please visit. You'll find either on Facebook in the comments section or on Zoom in the chat links. Uh, particularly, I'd like to point out, we have a page of resources and references related to today's topics on the FIJA website. Uh, from what I've heard here, I have a couple more that I'm going to add for you uh, in the next day or so. Also, if you visit fija.org slash next, you will find out how to participate in our Monday evening 15 minute update sessions, 15 minutes with Fija, and our upcoming webinar, Punishment Without Trial, a conversation with Professor Carissa Byrne Hessick. Uh, she is the author of Punishment Without Trial, uh, and we will be discussing her book, specifically focusing on jury nullification, which she gets into just a little bit, but I don't think it uh, is probably something that's been covered uh, very, very much in her interviews and webinars thus far. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Clark. Thank you, Mike, for joining me again this year. Uh, I have learned so much myself. I hope uh, that each of you <laughs> will consider joining us again next year. Uh, surprisingly, I am leaving on a slightly optimistic note and to give everyone uh, the last word, if, if Mike Clark and Catherine could just in maybe a phrase or two, uh, let us know, are, are things looking up, things looking down, things about the same, just a, a quick temperature check. We'll start with you, Catherine. Well, our rights reside in four boxes, as you know, the soap box, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. And I am optimistic because more people are realizing just how important that jury box is. 
because of the cases they've seen in public and what they're seeing in their community. So that gives me some optimism that we are focused in the right place uh, and are concerned about the right things. Wonderful, and Clark? Yeah, nothing terrifies a prosecutor more than a jury that's been informed of its ability to acquit against the evidence and what the sentencing consequences might be for the defendant. So the whole edifice of coercive plea bargaining depends on the systematic suppression of information. And our country, to its everlasting credit, is not well set up for government suppression of information. Ultimately, I think the edifice of coercive plea bargaining is going to be is going to come crumbling down because prosecutors cannot suppress the dissemination of this information forever, no matter how hard they might try. And finally, Mike, things looking up, things looking down, things about the same. What do you got for us? I'm optimistic. I, there's a quote by Thomas Jefferson that I love. Uh, he talks about the war for liberty is won by inches, paraphrase. But he used that term one by inches. And so every time that I see a state reform its asset forfeiture laws, every time I see a case of jury nullification, every time I hear uh, smart people like the folks on this panel talking about these reforms and pushing these things forward, I know that we are gaining those inches and little by little we're regaining liberty. So I'm optimistic because I, I, I see that progress, even though sometimes it's small and incremental. Well, finally, I just want to thank Lisa Lewis, our volunteer who seriously saved our bacon today. The fact that you can see all of our panelists is solely to her credit. <laughs> we had a little technical issue literally seconds before go time, and she figured out a workaround for us. So huge thanks to Lisa Lewis. And also thank you to everyone who participated, our attendees on Zoom, and those of you joining us on Facebook. And if you're watching this later, thank you so much as well. Uh, that wraps up this year's 2022 State of the American Jury System presentation, and we plan to make this an annual event, so be sure and uh, get on our, our email list, and uh, we will be sure to let you know about it next year. Thank you so much, everyone.